My presentation this morning, I'm going to look at production, persistence and diversity. And I suppose I see these as the three drivers that we have within our native pastures. But they're all linked and the impact we have on one of them is likely to have an impact on another of the characteristics. So we need to be conscious of the three within our systems. And some of them we have control over and some of them that we don't have control over. So this morning I'm going to talk about each of these characteristics, production, persistence and diversity individually. And then I'm going to talk about a case study where I'm, I try to bring these characteristics together and look at how they work. So in terms of production, the factors that I think, or the main factors that I think affect the production of our native pastures are soil characteristics, rainfall and temperature. So in terms of soil factors, this, was, uh, this is work that's been done at Hamilton in southwest Victoria on a long-term phosphate trial. So this trial's been going for over 35 years now and has looked at different rates of phosphorus application and production of the pastures. These pastures have been continually stocked with animals and although the pastures um, are, well, was a pasture that was sown to Phalaris, I think the same characteristics apply to our native pastures. So across the bottom here we've got the different rates of, of phosphorus, so um, kilograms of P per hectare per year, and they put rates on from... Back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, from 5 kilograms per hectare per year right through to 25 kilograms per hectare per year of P, and looked at the different pasture growth rates. And I suppose the, the message I want to get from this graph is that um, the curve flattens out. And so around that 10 kilograms of P per hectare per year, that is where the maximum growth rate occurs, with diminishing returns after that. And so up to that level, pasture production was, was doubled. So now I wanted to talk about some results from um, some of our Evergrey's work. I mean, Phil talked about Evergrey's work here at Orange. So this is from the Aubrey Wodonga proof site. And so at that, our Chilton proof site, we looked at um, applications of fertiliser on native pastures. And so prior to this work, uh, we knew that we could increase productivity from our native pastures by applying phosphate to them. But often what occurred when we increased the fertility levels in our soils was we lost the perennial component of, this, of the pasture. The annual grasses outcompeted the natives and so we ended up with a pasture that was much more dominated by annual species. So what we wanted to look at was if we combined increasing fertility with grazing, whether we could maintain that, the perennial component. So we had four different treatments, um, two different fertiliser rates, um, one with a low fertility of 11 kilograms of phosphorus applied every second year, and then the high fertility rates of 21 kilograms of P <coughs> annually. And we then looked at different stocking rates, a low and a high stocking rate, um, looking at set stocking and also rotational grazing. And the rotational grazing was just a simple um, four paddock rotation. And so I suppose Again, I wanted to just show here that with the, um, so across the top here, we have the herbage production in kilograms per hectare. We have our different stocking rates with the, the purple being the, the low stocking rate and the green being the high stocking rate and our rainfall across the bottom. And I suppose one of the key messages I wanted to show from this was that the main driver of the production from our systems was what was, do, what was happening with the rainfall, something that we had no control over whatsoever. So even though we had the right, what we thought were the right pastures and the right soil conditions, um, the rainfall had the biggest influence on what was happening at our site. Within our system we also um, looked at lamb growth rates and I think this links quite well into some of the messages that Brett had in his presentation just before mine. So we we're able to achieve off our native pasture lamb growth rates of between 206 and 320 grams per head per day, depending on the season. And we averaged weaning weights of between um, uh, 29 and 32 um, kilograms. We are, were able to achieve these high weaning percentages from our pastures when we um, abided by the lifetime wool condition scores. <coughs> <coughs> 
But what we looked at in the last year of our trial, when we um, removed the, when we when we had a wet summer, so lots of green feed over the summer months, we looked at keeping those lambs on the site to see whether we could what the growth rate rates were like on those lambs. So I forget that I can't use the electronic thing. So, so this is when they were weaned, and so up to weaning we had really good lamb growth rates. But after weaning, even though we had microlina that was green and looked like it was actively growing, we had really low growth rates. So we were only averaging after that period uh, 67 grams per head per day. So I think from our side, with the native grasses we had and the system we had in place, we could only produce store lambs. We, there wasn't a situation where we could finish lambs on our native pastures. The other evergraze site we had within the Albury Wodonga trial was the Holbrook Pru site. And the Holbrook site looked at um, whether an integrated system would work. As was mentioned previously, um, most people think of um, the hill country where the native pastures are is where you put the weathers and the improved phalaris pasture on the lower country is where you have your native grasses. This trial looked at whether we could integrate those systems. So there was three treatments in this trial. One had separate flocks, so they had weathers on the hill country on the native pasture and ewes and lambs on the phalaris pasture in a four paddock rotation in the lower country. The second, trial, the second treatment looked at integrating with the addition of fertiliser with the one flock um, of the ewes um, grazing on the lower country where the phalaris is but also strategically grazing the native hill country. And the, the third treatment was, was just without fertiliser on the hill country. So the key messages that came out of the Holbrook site were the integrated system produced, so that's a system with using the, utilising the hills and the phalaris country with the one flock, was able to achieve 136 to 222 kilograms of lamb per hectare and, and 11 to 18 kilograms of wool per hectare. Whereas a separate system only achieved 75 to 156 kilograms of lamb per hectare and 18 to 21 kilograms of wool per hectare. And there was no treatment difference in terms of the lamb weaning weights or the lamb weaning percentage or the amount of clean wool cut per hectare. So the gross margins of the integrated system were significantly higher than the separate system. So I think this trial really illustrates that if we have, have lower country and with, with improved pasture on it and hill country, we can integrate the systems to get the best out of both systems. So then we'll move on to persistence. And again, I, I think some of the points that I cover in persistence were covered in, in Brett's talk earlier. Some of the things that influence persistence of our species, whether they're native or introduced, include grazing method, what animal we have grazing the, the, the pasture, the palatability of the plants we have in the system, the location of the growing points of those plants, and also population biology, when the plants produce seed and how much seed they produce. So we know that um, there's different grazing systems, both Phil and Brett talked about this, whether we rotationally graze our, our pastures or whether we set stocked. And you know, grazing implicitly results in variation in the frequency and intensity of when the plants are defoliated, which has consequences on the persistence and production of these species. By regulating the grazing pattern, um, you know, grazing management is one of the key tools we have to increase the persistence of desirable species. And I think we know that um, a stable perennial grass system cannot be maintained under continuous grazing, that we need some rotational grazing. And rotational grazing usually has more benefit on the plant than it does on the animal. Often in terms of rotational grazing systems, we don't see um, <coughs> growth rates in terms of animals or turnoff rates in terms of lambs per hectare as high as we do in a system that's set stocked. And I think that showed through in some of the results that Phil presented from the Evergrow site. And this is just exactly what Brett said about how 
how, how different animals graze. And I think that, you know, there's good linkages between the talks here and I think, you know, key messages come through when, when things are repeated. So, you know, cattle are a lot easier in the, in the way that they graze pastures because even though they're not as selective as what sheep are and they don't graze nearly as low. And this has a big impact on the persistence of, of our species, how different animals graze. So with the Evergrace site at Chilton, we looked at basal cover of, of the grasses. And again, I think, I'll just explain this slide and then I'll... <laughs> so we looked at the, the persistence in terms of basal cover of both the wallaby grass and the microlina. Um, and so this is 2008 through to 2012. Um, and so the grey is the, the wallaby grass basal cover and the green is the microlina basal cover. And so with our, our treatments in place, as Phil mentioned, we all graze to, um, at the key benchmarks were 80% um, ground cover or, or 800 kilograms per hectare when the stock were removed. You can see this had a big impact on the persistence of the species within our pasture. And we got increases in both the, the wallaby grass, which is the grey one, and also the microlina. But the other key factor in terms of the increase in those is the rainfall we had. So this summer, this is, these numbers I've got here are the summer rainfall event, summer rainfall totals, so December, January, February rainfall. We had a very wet summer in 2011. We had a, an incredibly wet February with over 100 millimetres of rainfall. And that had a big impact on the recruitment and the basal cover of the microlina. I think it also had a big impact on the, the wallaby grass basal cover, but because the wallaby grass plants were so tiny as seedlings in 2011, we didn't detect the number of plants that were there. And we didn't detect that until 2012, that big increase in number. So again, one of the things we don't have control over is that rainfall and when we get rainfall and how much we get. But I think if we have systems in place in terms of, of ground cover, and also dry matter targets, we can then make the most use of when that rainfall occurs. The other point is um, location of growing points. It has a big impact on how persistent our plants are in pastures. So this is a microlina plant. As Phil mentioned, I did my PhD on microlina, so I did a lot of detailed study on, on microlina. And so this was, um, I, I dug up a whole range of microlina plants to look at where the growth point of the plant was. So this is the, the ground surface, here's the red line. And so these are the growth points, so that's a, a new tiller coming up there, and then also we've got new tillers coming up here. So this tiller here is coming from about two centimetres below the ground surface. And I found that quite commonly in the microlina plants that I dug up. That it, it has quite low growing points and so therefore can be grazed quite low and still survive. Not that I'm encouraging people to graze quite low, but I think that's why often in situations where we have seen overgrazing, that microlina is one of the plants that still persists in those situations because it is quite tolerant of that um, hard grazing. So palatability also um, has an impact on persistence. I think we all, all know that, you know, when we're out there in the paddock, sometimes when you pull up a leaf, there's a certain smell to it that doesn't smell very nice and you think, why do animals not like this? And you can understand when you smell it. So it's, you know, the texture of the plant, you know, whether it's hairy or, or smooth, the aroma of the plant, how hairy it is, the plant age and the plant life stage can also affect how palatable it is. Again, I think this links quite well back into what Brett was talking about and also what Claire was talking about, that we need to understand when our plants are going to head uh, because that affects how palatable they are to animals. So within my PhD, I, I looked at um, population biology of microlina to understand the different stages of growth. So I, I undertook this study at our... Um, Chilton Evergrace site, and we had um, mature plants with a basal cover about 19% microlina. I looked at when the plants produce seed, and so microlina produces seed over a very long period. It produced seed from early November 
right through unt until March, but it was very dependent on rainfall. If rain fell, it produced seed heads. I'm sure you all know this if you've got microlena in your paddock, it will just keep putting up seed heads if there's rainfall events. And in that system, it was producing about 800 seeds per metre squared, so quite a large number of seeds. I looked at predation as to what happened to those seeds. So I set up this little trial with microlena seeds and with phalaris seeds because phalaris seed is known to be um, quite commonly taken by ants and often when people sow phalaris um, it's treated to stop ant predation. So I looked at microlena seeds and phalaris seeds and I had little cages that I put over it to stop things like birds coming and eating it but ants could still access those cages. So with the microlena seeds I lost 30% of the seeds that I put out within a 24 hour period. So there's large predation of the seed. I don't know what took the seed. I <laughs> That's another study, I think, what took the seed. <laughs> but something takes the seed in, in, in quite a large amount in quite a short period. I looked at the seed banks. So I dug up um, soil samples and I then germinated soil samples to see how much microlena germinated. In the first year I did it, the microlena seed was only 0.05% of the seed bank. In the second year, it was 0.01% of the seed bank. The seed bank was really dominated by annual species. So there's only a really small number of microlena seeds there with lots of other seeds present. So if it germinated, it would have large competition from other species. With the seed that I'd collected, it only had about a 34% germination percentage, so quite low. Then I looked at how many seedlings I could find in the paddock. So I spent ages on my hands and knees pulling plants apart and crawling around. And I only, with all the sampling I did, on average I could find around five seedlings per metre squared. So even though lots of seed was produced, lots was taken by an animal, something, yeah, only about five seedlings per metre squared were there. The bit of the study that I didn't do was, was what the survival of those seedlings were. How many of those seedlings became mature plants? But I think the real um, message here that I'm trying to get across is that recruitment of things like microlena in many of our native grasses is quite a rare event. We need to manage the perennial, the adult plants we've got present because recruitment may not occur. <coughs> The next bit I was going to cover quite briefly is diversity because I think that's probably the main focus of, of, of Jackie's talk. Is, so diversity is just a small component of my presentation. So in the grasslands of North America, in the prairies there, there's been quite a lot of work done by, by David Tillman. And he's shown that the more diverse pastures have a lot, better, a lot higher production, are a lot more highly productive than monocultures. And so diverse pastures have higher production. And, and this is, revolves around you know, ecosystem functioning and the biodiversity that we get in within these pastures. And also things um, in, in terms of, of, of carbon stores as well within these highly diverse pastures. However, I think in Australia, um, a lot of the pastures that I deal with from an agricultural point of view uh, are quite modified systems and that they're not, they're diverse in what species they, they have there, but a lot of that diversity is based on introduced species in the system, not native species in the system. So I think you've probably all seen this model before that's put up about the change from original species composition to um, potential agricultural productivity. And so most of our original native, native grasslands, you know, had the poa tussocks and the kangaroo grass. With some modification, they ended up with spear grass and red grass. And the highly modified, highly productive native pastures are the weeping grass, wallaby grass. And I suppose this is the area that I have based most of my research in and, and mainly work in. But there's that continuum of those different grasslands and grass pastures. And again, again, I think following on from something that Phil said in his presentation, that we have different species occurring in, in different parts of the landscape. And 
those species perform different functions in different parts of the landscape. So at our Chiltern site, we mapped out where different species occurred throughout the pasture, the main species being the microlinas, um, the wallaby grasses and the spear grasses. And I think probably a lot of you are aware that even though spear grass, something like spear grass isn't highly productive or highly desirable in a lot of our systems, it performs an important role. It often occurs on those hills that would be quite bare if it wasn't there. And so it's probably not the most palatable species, which is probably good because being on those hills, it provides that ground cover through the summer months and that water use through the summer months. Uh, now I just wanted to talk, do a little bit of a case study um, on some work that we did in 2004 looking at production, persistence and diversity. So we conducted a survey in late summer, early autumn and we went out at that time of year because we thought it was easiest to identify what species we had, in the, had there because we were particularly looking for the native grasses. We looked from the 550 to 750 millimetre average annual rainfall zone and we randomly chose 60 farms and it was truly random. They were randomly generated numbers or grid points and then we identified who owned that grid point and then we visited that farm. We targeted paddocks that would not be sown to perennial pastures. And within those paddocks we um, looked at botanical composition, soil information and paddock history. Within each of those sites, we um, had nine sites within that paddock and then 20 survey points at each of those nine sites. So this is where the range of sites were, um, ranging from you know, central New South Wales through to central Victoria along the Great Dividing Range. So within the north central Goulburn Broken and North East CMAs in New South Wales, in Victoria and then in the Murray and Murray Bidgee and Lachlan catchments. So we visited lots of hill country like this that we walked on to find out what species were there. So the first point from that is, uh, so <coughs> I suppose I'll use a pointer. Um, so the size of the dot indicates how much perennial native grasses are present in the site. So the smallest dot is less than 25% and the largest dot is greater than 75% native grass present. So you can see that no, none of the sites visited were totally annual, although some of them, like the ones sort of near where I live, um, had very low proportions of natives still left in them. So this we've just flattened out at those same sites, but just so that you can see the proportions. So each, each little um, pie chart represents each of the sites and so the dark green is the total perennial, um, the paler green is the annual grass, <laughs> this colour is the legume and then we've got the broad leaf and then we've got summer grasses. <laughs> you think that'll be easier? <laughs> so 62% of the sites had greater than 50% perennial and being, having perennial, it may have only been one small perennial plant per quadrat, but it was still pre perennials were present there. Um, 61 different species were recorded, um, 12 different native grasses, and you know, two properties had eight different native grass species present on them. And I think that's the thing that within our native pastures, there is often a range of species and knowing what you've got there and knowing how to manage it is important. The other thing that I should mention about this is that you'll see um, again, as was mentioned previously, that, that north-south divide as to where um, C4 grasses were present compared to C3. So then we did some modelling of, um, of this data that we had and looked at potential production we determined based on the daily growth rate at each site location, incorporating measured pasture production, fertility and climate data over 50 years. And the model incorporated seasonal growth and digestibility of each species to determine the potential productivity of it. And we looked at grazing weathers. And so we looked at, so this is the carrying capacity in DSEs, and this is the percent perennial. 
And so I think we ended up with quite a nice relationship here that the higher percent perennial that we had in the pastures, the higher ca carrying capacity we could achieve off those pastures, which we thought was a you know, pretty good relationship there. Um, then we looked at uh, percent broadleaf grasses or, or weeds we had in the pasture, and again with that comparing, carrying capacity. So the more broadleaf weeds, you know, the less carrying capacity. Again, quite a nice relationship there. But then when we tried to look at the total species number and the carrying capacity, didn't see, it doesn't have any relationship there. And I think that is, as I mentioned previously, that these are such highly modified systems that we just can't achieve that relationship with the higher number of species that we have present to the higher um, carrying capacity of the system. So I think from the, from the study, um, case study, the conclusions are that, you know, these um, hill country pastures still do have some native perennial species present and they can be up managed with appropriate management strategies to increase that proportion of perennials. And so this is my concluding slide. So, as I mentioned at the start, you know, there's three drivers, I think, within our systems in terms of outcomes, in terms of production, persistence and diversity. And they're all interrelated. So, temperate grasslands provide a very valuable grazing resource. In Australia and worldwide, our grasslands are very important communities. However, they're highly modified systems. And the persistence of those perennial species is important. We know that recruitment of many of our native pastures only occurs occasionally or is a, a rare event. So we need to maintain the perennial species we have in our systems. And diversity of species does provide resilience, although with the case study work, diversity does not always equal production because our systems are highly modified. And I suppose, my final point on this is, I think that the message that's been made by other people is that we need to really identify what species we have in our paddocks. If we don't know what we've got there, we can't manage it effectively. So we need to know what we've got there so we can manage it. Thank you. <laughs>